Welcome to worship at Trinity United Methodist Church in Hutchinson, Kansas. I'm Pastor Michael. On behalf of Pastor Kim and myself, I'd just like to welcome you, and we pray that this worship service will bring you peace and joy. A couple of quick announcements. I uh, wanted to let you know, after a lot of discussion and prayer, we have decided to go ahead and suspend in-person worship services for the time being because of the rapid rise in COVID cases in Reno County. It was not an easy decision to make because we have loved uh, worshiping in person for the last nine Sundays, uh, but this is the right thing for now, and we're doing this because we love you and want to protect your health and well-being, so we appreciate that you understand. Uh, today was going to be Commitment Sunday if we had gathered in worship in the sanctuary, uh, but since it's not, uh, what I want to do is invite you to mail in your commitment card with your estimate of giving for 2021. Uh, many of you have already mailed them in, and we appreciate that. And I just want to say a word of thanks for your continued faithfulness and generosity. Um, next Sunday, there'll be a couple of special things going on. First of all, it'll be All Saints Sunday. And so we'll have a special ceremony of remembrance for the dearly departed members of our church who have died in the last year. Um, and so we hope you'll join us for that special ceremony online and recorded. And then in addition, we'll also be sharing communion together virtually. And so we invite you to have the elements ready at home, uh, especially bread or crackers and juice. And then if you want to have other things like a cross or a candle or a Bible to kind of help set uh, that sacred moment for yourself at home, we invite you to do that. And then finally, we, we had several projects where we were going to be collecting things in the coming weeks. Um, one example is the Winter Warmies collection. Um, and instead of having you go out to the store and risk picking up COVID, we're just going to ask you to make donations and we'll make sure those items get purchased. So we appreciate your support of that ministry as well. All right, I'm going to ask you to now please join me in the call to worship. Our lives are in the care of God. God has given us abundance and hope. This day, we have come to praise and thank God for all that God has done for us. We gather to celebrate God's love and to offer our lives in service. Come, let us open our hearts to the Lord. Let us rejoice in God's goodness and love. Amen.
Today, as part of our annual stewardship program, we're going to continue to have members of our church come forward and share a little bit of their personal testimony. Our theme is perseverance through faith. And the scripture that we're relying on for this theme is Hebrews 12 that says, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Uh, we've already heard from Dustin Petz and from Jeff Olenberger and John Somerville in the last three Sundays. And today I'm just thrilled to invite Susan Sankey to come forward and to share with you a little bit of her story. Susan serves as the Vice President for the Kansas Agricultural and Rural Leadership Program. So Susan, welcome, and thank you for being willing to speak today. Thank you. Just a few weeks ago, on September the 10th, I received an email from Pastor Michael asking me to provide a message to the church, a message about stewardship. He explained this year's theme, Perseverance Through Faith. I'm thinking, with everything going on, you picked a good theme. Here we are in a pandemic. We live in a world where change is constant. A year ago, who'd have thought we'd now be donning masks, attending virtual meetings, stocking up on hand sanitizer and disinfectant wipes, and that we'd be so excited to find multiple rolls of toilet paper. But here we are, attending virtual worship. We've picked up some new terminology, too. Shelter in place, social distancing, flatten the curve, Rona, short for coronavirus, Zoom weary, when we're so tired of virtual meetings that we can be in all day, and spendemic, which refers to the online shopping occurring during the pandemic. The guiding scripture for this perseverance through faith theme is Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Pastor Michael asked me to share a time about when I've persevered, so I think, huh, how do I narrow down all those challenging and tough times into a single experience that my high school English teacher would be proud of, that I would have a narrow scope to make the main point? So I've got to find the main thing. So I thought I was going to talk this Sunday about the law enforcement officer that was shot in the neighboring county, the third one in a year and a half. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll talk about the people standing in line to vote, how important that is. Then I thought I was going to talk about the Supreme Court nominee and the testimony before the Senate. And then I watched the dueling town halls, and I thought I'm not going to talk about that. I think of how I came to be in this congregation, in this church. I was married for seven years and my first husband died in a really bad accident. The pickup rolled end over end multiple times, the officer reported. I'd lost a husband I'd been married to for seven years. And now I've been married to Lee for almost 24 years. Meeting Lee was a real blessing to me. His dad had died at an early age and Lee had decided to return to Kansas in his hometown. So here I am, here we are and our lives had changed. We were married and Trinity has become our church home. I cannot recall the exact date that it happened, but soon I was asked to teach the Duo Sunday School class, Do Unto Others, not to be confused with the Doers class. I agreed to teach, or at least try. Every third Sunday I used the long chosen adult Bible studies curriculum to try and deliver some scriptural lesson to this group. I always challenged myself to get the class to engage. It's fun to talk about it. One of my favorite things was to read the adult Bible studies current events supplement. Always a great stimulator of conversation. When I started, the class was about 40 to 50 people every Sunday. The chairs set up in rows, one row after another, just like a classroom. These people worshiped together here at Trinity as the group that became known as the duo class. 
They started this when they were young adults. They had children, they raised their children together, and then their children became young adults themselves, and then older adults. Sometimes we'd get a little off topic and I'd hear stories about the additions that they helped the church build as it grew and needed more space. They served as mentors to young people going through confirmation and joining the church. They celebrated Christmas together. They gathered at a local restaurant for lunch after worship and Sunday school. Every Sunday, there would be communi- there, there would be communication about who might be ill, maybe a fall, a move to Wesley Towers, if someone needed prayers, trips being taken and children coming to visit, We talk about the chiefs, hospitalizations, and who died. We'd sing happy anniversary and happy birthday. Gradually, with each passing year, we lost people from the class, and someone was assigned to pass around the Folgers can labeled Memorial to gather a collection for a special project or ministry at the church in in memory of a dear duo classmate. The rows and rows of chairs became a small but mighty circle of about six or eight. We laugh together, sometimes we mourn, but mostly we laugh. Together, we faithfully run this race called life. When I got the phone call and heard their decision, hello, yes, okay, I understand, This virus has made it too risky to gather, and those left as part of the duo class decided to stop having their traditional class. I just paused for a minute. They may have asked me to teach, but it was I who learned far more from this special group than I could ever possibly teach. Their dedication to each other, to the church, through thick and thin, is a lesson to us all. So many lives I saw so well lived and committed to the church and its people. In a roundabout way, it was the death of my first husband and the death of my husband's father that brought us together and brought me to Trinity. The loss of both my parents in a short time period and just a few years ago, the people of the duo class who've died and those who remain, we rejoice together through worship and through whatever it is God calls us to do. We persevere. We're the church. Through life and through death, Jesus is our Lord and Savior is our main thing, the perfecter of our faith. Even when we are apart, we are together. Together, we're the church. This is our main thing. God makes sure of this, and for this, we persevere. Ultimately, it's because of the death of Jesus who died for all of us so that we can come together. Change is constant, yet we figure out a way and we persevere. Thank you, Susan. So, how many of you like to watch game shows? I am a child of the 70s, and so I've always been a big fan of TV game shows. One of my favorite ones, though, is probably Let's Make a Deal. Maybe because of the crazy costumes that they're always wearing. But on that show, contestants would be given a chance to trade a prize that they already won for what was hidden behind curtain one, two, or three. Sometimes they would win a great prize, and sometimes it was pretty much worthless. So today, I thought we would play the game so you can see how it works. All right, to begin the game, I have a prize for someone who made their bed today. Randy, come on down. Yes, come on down. That's a different game show. Okay, so you won this amazing prize of M&M's. I know. Okay, now, 
Before we go any further, I'm gonna offer you a deal. You can keep that treat that I gave you, or you can have what's in bag number one. But before you make your decision, I wanna tell you that one of these bags has a really nice prize in it, and the other two, maybe not so much. So, do you wanna trade? Yes. Yes, I wanna trade. Okay, okay, Randy's made his first deal. <laughs> now, we're gonna just start, and we're gonna see what's in bag number three. Can you see what's in there? It's a rock. It's a rock. Not a really great prize, right? Okay, so we know that the good prize is in either one or two. So before we go on, do you want to take what's in bag number two? Mm -hmm. Should we make a deal? Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, yes. All right, now before you open your prize that you've chosen, let's see what's in bag number one. Mm hmm Oh, Randy. This could be a good prize. It's kind of the end of a leftover roll of toilet paper. So, I don't know, that could be considered good. Okay, but now you can open what's in bag number two. It must be the great prize, right? It must be, it must be. It's a big bag of M&Ms. Congratulations, Randy. You did a great job making a deal. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, that turned out pretty well for Randy, didn't it? Unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way in real life. Sometimes people go through life making deals and trying to get more money and more wealth. They think that the more money and the more possessions that they have, the happier they will be. But Jesus, he warned us about that. He said, be on guard against all types of greed. He then told a story, and we're going to hear more about this story later. But he told this story about this man whose land had produced so much grain that he had no place to store it anymore. Even though he had plenty, he wanted more. And so he decided to tear down his barns and build bigger ones. Jesus said the man was a fool, for when his life was over, he would have to leave everything behind. Now, life is not a TV game show, and God doesn't make deals. God has promised to supply all of our needs, but he has not promised to fulfill every selfish wish that we have. I hope this week you'll spend some time thinking about how grateful you are for all that you have. Would you pray with me? Dear God, help us to be content with the blessings which you have generously given us and help us to be on guard against selfishness and greed. Amen. Our prayer time is an opportunity for us to come to the Lord and share what's on our hearts today. I want to invite you to join me in silent prayer. And in, during this time, you may give thanks for the joys and blessings in your lives. You may take a moment to ask for forgiveness where you have made mistakes or where you have sinned. Or may use this time just to bring your challenges, your concerns, your worries, and just hand them all over to the Lord. So let's take a moment to pray in silence. Almighty God, source of all that makes life possible and giver of all that makes life good. We gather to give you our thanks, and yet we confess, Lord, that we have often failed to live out our thankfulness. What we have, we take for granted, and we grumble about what we lack. We have squandered your bounty with little thought of those who will come after us. We're more troubled by a few who have more than by the many who have less. Forgive us, O oh God, and in this hour of worship, accept our thanksgiving 
and teach us to make gratitude and sharing our way of life. Through the grace of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Join me now in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for that, Lori. Our scripture today comes from the 12th chapter of Luke, verses 13 through 21, the parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Do you have an abundance of possessions? What do you like to save or hoard? Personally, I always have to have my favorite creamer on hand and a backup available. I also need several 15-calorie lemonade containers on hand to wet my whistle throughout the day. All those things are essential. Right? 
I guess only to me. What makes us gather up more than we need so that we feel like we have enough? We all want to be prepared, right? How can we be prepared spiritually? Today's scripture story contains important insights about trusting God with what we need. And I don't know about you, but I want to live out each day concentrating on spiritual truths that shape my choices. Let us pray. God of abundance, teach us through Jesus' teachings and stir up within us new understandings and convictions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are now concluding our four-week study of Adam Hamilton's book, Enough. We have explored ways to improve our relationship with money by concentrating on God's provisions and not misusing our money or credit. We studied living a life of generosity and discipleship by defining one's life purpose and priorities through financial principles budgets. We identified the secret of contentment as not being based on circumstances, only one's relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, we will explore how to define enough by generosity. Today is our Commitment Sunday, and we will have an opportunity to respond from our new spiritual understandings and practice Genuine generosity. In today's scripture from Luke, Jesus tells the parable of a rich man, again, whose land produced abundantly and whose first century agricultural retirement funds that ended up being fully funded. What should I do, he asks, for I have no place to store my crops. He decides to pull down his barns and build larger ones, so that the retire, in retirement he can relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God has little regard for these plans and says, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? The rich man clearly should have been doing some expirement planning along with his retirement planning. Jesus concludes the parable by predicting the same fate for all people who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. Jesus calls each of us to be rich towards God and prepared for the end of life. I am proposing that we need to wrestle with some realities, and one of them being that bigger is not necessarily better. Jesus denied that concept with his whole being. If bigger is better, then why did the Messiah come to Israel, a tiny, insignificant desert country? If bigger is better, why did Jesus choose only 12 special companions to teach? If bigger is better, why did Jesus pour out extra love and attention to the poor, the sick, the friendless, the helpless, the very old and the very young. Our culture today is based more heavily heavily on material things than ever before. We are consumed with consuming. We must have the latest, the fastest, the newest, the biggest or the smallest, the costliest and the coolest. Sure, it's nice to have stuff. It's even nicer to have new stuff or if your thing is antiques, new old stuff. But the next time you reach for your credit card or your checkbook, ask yourself, am I stocking up on possessions or treasures? Sometimes we confuse the two. We see luxury cars, elegant clothes, gorgeous houses, and expensive electronic equipment as treasures in our lives, yet they are not. At best, they're just things we possess. At worst, They are things that possess us. What is the difference? You possess a job. You treasure your family. You possess a house, a bank account, a car, a great wardrobe. You treasure your home, your friends, 
your freedom, your health, and your time, you treasure love. Adam Hamilton states that true treasure hunters are found serving dinner at the homeless shelter. They're found doing chores and errands for someone who is housebound. They are found sitting with their children and talking heart to heart. They are found praying on their knees. We can all be successful treasure hunters because each of us has access to the key that reveals all the two treasures of life, Jesus the Christ. In him, we are all made wondrously rich before God. Let's look at a few spiritual principles taken from Adam's book. We are created to give, yet we are tempted to keep. There are two voices that war against our God-given impulse towards generosity. The first voice is the voice of fear, and which tells us if you give, there may not be enough left over for you. We are all afraid to be generous because we we're worried about what might happen to us. What if we don't have enough to fill the gas tank or buy groceries or pay the bills? We panic. Fear, along with a misplaced idea about the true source of our identity, keeps us from being generous and leads us to hoard what we have especially during a pandemic. You've seen it in pictures, in person, empty shelves at grocery stores everywhere. I think the panic buying started about two weeks ago and it just has not stopped since. Panic buying, filling your cart with more than you need, just in case. The biggest thing we want our customers to know is that panic buying is not necessary. Jessica Trowbridge works for King Supers. We have supply. We are just trying to keep up with the demand. Chris Staff is a rep for Safeway. Both chains say there are enough supplies, but so much overbuying is making it hard for the supply chain to catch up. Part of the problem is as soon as those products are hitting the shelves, we have customers in our stores taking them off. Both chains are asking customers to stop panic buying. We're actually limiting some items, some of the high demand items. Um, like the hand sanitizer, like the cleaning products, um, just to make sure that all customers get what they need. Their message, be considerate. Buy only what you need, more is on the way. We absolutely have the, um, the supply in our warehouse. We're just pushing it out there as quick as we can and stocking it to make sure that those products are available. Lori Lizarraga, Nine News. The truth is that hoarding offers us no real security in this world. The second voice is the voice of self-gratification, which tells us if you give, you won't have enough money to buy the stuff you want to make you happy. And as our culture screams that life is uh, made up of possessions and pleasurable experiences, then we find ourselves thinking, if I give, there won't be enough for me. God designed us to be generous. God created within us the willingness to give to God and to others. That's part of our makeup. We actually have the need to be generous. But these voices of fear and self-gratification can defeat us at the moment uh, in daily living. But yet, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ when we invite him to be Lord and allow the Holy Spirit to begin changing us from the inside out, we find out that our fears begin to lessen and our aim in life shifts from seeking personal pleasure to pleasing God and caring for others. Now, these spiritual realizations bring us to a central theological foundation for generosity. Life is a gift and Everything belongs to God. Even your capacity to acquire wealth is a gift from God. Now, as the Holy Spirit works in our lives, we begin to think less about ourselves and more about others. We begin to see the needs of others and wonder, if I don't do something, who will? As this change takes place within us, we begin to experience real joy. We discover that we find more joy in doing things for others and for God than we ever did in doing things for ourselves. 
This is what Jesus meant when he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. How can we be rich toward God? By giving to God our, from our first fruit. From the early days of the Old Testament, God's people observed the practice of giving some portion of the best of what they had to God. In the time of Moses, the tithe was structured into the law. God claimed one-tenth of the best the people had. Before giving to the poor and taking care of themselves, they were to bring one-tenth of their first fruits to God. As described in Leviticus 27, all tithes from the land, whether the seed from the ground or the fruit from the tree, are the Lord's. They are holy to the Lord. Now we give our tithes in the church to accomplish the work of God's kingdom through the body of Christ. As you can see here, here's our brothers and sisters at Trinity serving others in our community and beyond. As we give, um, the church is responsible for praying and discerning how God wants to use all the resources. Still, tithing can be a challenging idea for many of us. It can be a stretch, especially for us when we're wrestling with fear, the voices of fear. Now, Adam Hamilton effectively uses a visual of apples to explain the idea of tithing. So I'd like to borrow his ideas here. Now, tithing is giving the best apple to God before we consume all the others. I have 10 apples here, and I have my best apple, my first fruit that I'm going to give to God. And I have nine other apples that I can use to live and, and give and take care of my family. And uh, when I give that first fruit, um, I express my praise and love, faithfulness and worship and devotion to God. But then life happens. Have you ever wondered about how will I pay the bills and have all the stuff I want with just nine apples? So we decide that the Lord will not mind if we just take a little bite of his apple. After all, that's a trip we want to take, and it's really important. So we take a bite out of God's apple, the one that is holy to God and meant to be used for God's purposes. The Lord will understand, right? Then Christmas comes, and we don't have enough money for all the presents we want to buy. So we take another bite out of God's apple. One day, a emer uh, medical emergency catches us by surprise. Well, we really didn't set aside money for an emergency fund, so we must take another bite out of God's apple, buying a new car, eating out, spending on this or that. Each expense takes a bite out of the apple that belongs to God. Soon, all that's left is the core. So we give the core to God and say, here's your portion, Lord. God receives not our first fruits and our best gifts, but our leftovers. You know, a, a, strange things happen, a strange thing happens when we give the first apple to God. We're not tempted to eat it because it's not there. And with God's help, we can... We can find ways to make the other nine apples meet our needs. Now, I realize this is challenging. I mean, uh, when you talk about a tithe, you may not even begin to start giving 10% to God right away. But I encourage you to take a step in that direction. Perhaps you can give 2% or 5% or 7%. God understands where you are, and God will help you make the adjustments necessary to become more and more generous. The truth is, regardless of our income, 
each of us is faced with the same question. How many apples are enough? And we have two choices. We can store them in storehouses or share them with others. We are blessed with more than enough apples to meet our needs when we put God first. Tithing is a floor. It's not a ceiling. God calls us then to grow beyond the tithe. After tithing 10%, we can also give to other things. We can up our tithe. We can give to the building project. We can give to church, to mission funds and, and schools and nonprofits. We give to meet the needs of God's kingdom. But Adam uses a really graphic yet extremely effective analogy. It is if we have become financially and spiritually constipated. <laughs> we keep taking in, we keep taking in, we're not giving out. After a while, it gets pretty uncomfortable and it causes us pain. Sometimes we may not even realize what is happening. We're taking it in, and, but it's not satisfying because we're not made to keep taking in and never giving back. Brothers and sisters, we are created for generosity. Over time, we become self-absorbed, money-consumed, joyless people. This is what a lifetime of financial and spiritual constipation looks like. Joylessness. And the only way to find relief is to learn to give. Generosity changes us, filling us with joy and filling our lives with blessings. When we are generous with what we have, we find unexpected blessings that flow back into our lives, catching us by surprise. Somewhere along the way, we see our acts of generosity, helping others, and perhaps even changing the world and we're changed. We say in wonder and amazement, wow, look what happened. Look what God did. And we are blessed. I'd like to close with reviewing what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Please give purposefully and cheerfully. Amen.
you for joining us during this time of worship. And if you'd like to give your offering by sending it in the mail, what a wonderful way to support the ministries here at Trinity and beyond. If you are watching online, we have a, you can give online by going to our website. And as we think about being a cheerful giver, may we truly know that our relationship with Jesus Christ is enough and that we are called to give to others. So as we continue in ministry together, may you uplift the Lord with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service, also your witness. Go in God's peace. Amen.